word. Okay. Um, hey, everybody. How's it going? I'm Sammy Feldblum, obviously, and I'm excited to be here with all of you and hear about all of your exciting research that you're embarking on. Um, my apologies in advance that my PhD program has uh, acculturated me to read from a script, which is, um, I feel like, kind of lame. But, you know, I'll do my best to keep it lively because it's late in the day. Um, I am going to be speaking today about uh, the political ecology of drought in Chile's Petorca province. So that's maybe two and a half hours north of here in the Quinta Región. Um, I'm in the geography program at UCLA, and um, my advisor here is a geographer at the U de Chile. Um, so just a little about me. Uh, I'm originally from North Carolina. I went to Brown undergrad. I studied very different things. Yeah, solidarity. Um, and then I became a reporter um, and kind of gradually worked my way toward uh, environmental reporting. Um, I reported on flooding in Houston, which was kind of my first engagement with water as sort of an index of intergroup social relations. Um, and there, of course, there was too much water. Um, and then I moved to New Mexico. So this is from my first trip to New Mexico. That's the Rio Grande running very dry. Um, and in New Mexico, I think even more clearly, uh, it was the case that the water system there really traces and kind of inscribes the social history of the place, um, including not only conceptually, but physically the, the water, the, the irrigation ditches that the Spanish dug when they colonized New Mexico still are very prevalent, especially in the north of the state. Um, so, so I lived in New Mexico. I was reporting in New Mexico. I was reporting on water and development. Um, I wrote my master's thesis uh, about New Mexico and about water governance and the social history of water there. Um, and as I was finishing my master's thesis in geography programs, we think a lot about kind of the soul crushing um, experience of global capitalism, I guess. Uh, <laughs> everyone in a geography department is like either Marxist or post-Marxist, or they're just an earth scientist. But all the human geographers, um, it's kind of like that. So, but simultaneously, Chile was writing this new constitution that I felt very excited about, um, at least from afar. Um, so I came down then in 2022 to um, report on the new constitution, which is a really interesting time to be here, of course. Um, it got voted down. Um, I guess I'll get into that in a minute. Anyway, I still sort of moonlight as a journalist. Here's a picture of me cheesing because they gave me a press pass at the, uh, at the Club Palestino game recently um, down in Rancagua. Uh, right, okay, so that's me. And, um, and so, yeah, so, so as I said, uh, my kind of pivot to Chile began in 2022 um, when I came down here to report. And the constitution was, I'm sure all of you know this to some degree, but it was kind of the result of a process that began with these really rollicking street protests in 2019 um, and ultimately culminated in this, in a one year constitution writing process. Um, and, uh, and I, I mean, I'm curious actually what people who were here then thought might happen. It seemed like polling indicated it would be voted down, but truly nobody knew. The vote was obligatory, which is new for Chile. Um, and so just no one knew what was gonna happen and it felt like a very historical moment. Um, anyway, among the changes that were gonna be included in the new constitution was a total overhaul of the country's system for water governance. Um, so, during my time down here, as part of my reporting, I met activists with the Movimiento para el Defenso del Agua, la Tierra y el Medio Ambiente, or Moda Tima, um, who organized for a right to water. And that movement emerged in the province of Petorca um, in 2012, in the early stages of an ongoing, quote unquote, mega drought. Um, and so in this area of Chile, rainfall or, or precipitation has dwindled between 20 and 40 percent um, in those years. And that is expected to kind of worsen for the foreseeable future. 
under climate change. Um, this is the Rio Petorca, um, which you can see is pretty much as dry as the Rio Grande when I showed up to New Mexico. So if I come to your city, then it's bad news, I guess. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and a, a big part of the story in Petorca, which I'll get into in a moment, um, was a kind of big build out of agribusiness and particularly avocado plantation for export. Um, so Moratima, the, this, this social movement emerged and, and it kind of inserted Petorca's drought particularly into the national consciousness of Chile to some degree. Um, so I think a lot of people when they think drought here um, now sort of think Petorca. Um, the constitution obviously was voted down, but it crystallized the contested politics of water in Chile. So my dissertation research, which is what I'm done here beginning now, um, is going to fo focus on that contestation um, to sort of determine methods of governing water here, uh, particularly amid drought. And here in the Paturco Riverbed, you can see a call to approve that new constitution is still emblazoned um, on the riverbed. So that's from September 2023, but it's still there. Um, so, yes. Um, so today I'll describe my dissertation research to come. Um, I'll begin with a narration of the relevant history of Chile's water system, beginning particularly with the uh, Pinochet era changes. Um, I will then turn to Petorca itself. Um, which is such a flashpoint for kind of struggles over water between different groups. Um, and then after introducing Petorca, I'll talk about my research questions and I ultimately probably won't talk about my timeline because I probably will run out of time by then. Um, so uh, we've covered this to some degree uh, today already, but um, in 1981, Pinochet's administration passed a water code governing the country's relatively scarce resources, um, which are hugely important for mining, for agribusiness, and for forestry, uh, all very important industries for Chile. Um, the system had justifications that were both technical and political. So on the technical side, there was a supposition that by turning uh, water governance over to markets, there would be, um, it, it would kind of instill a ethos of conservation that would free up water stores. Um, and, uh, and also it would allocate water toward its most economically beneficial uses. So there's a sort of faith that the market would shunt water toward economic benefit. Um, and then politically, privatized governance uh, was a response to the preceding era of uh, kind of increasing incorporation of the popular classes of Chile in, um, into the political sphere. Um, and particularly uh, right before Pinochet, obviously, um, there was a period of, of land reform begun by um, the Christian Democrats, but then continued and, and sort of strengthened under Allende, which redistributed uh, large land holdings to campesinos. Um, and came with a great deal of sort of social unrest. That was a, a time of great civil conflict in Chile. So this was a way to kind of ostensibly turn over governance um, to the market as, an, as, as a neutral mechanism for, for governing water um, and taking it out then of the hands of the state. Um, and so in subsequent years after uh, the Water Code of 1981 is passed um, and then sort of in kind of beginning, particularly in the late 80s, agribusiness boomed in the Chilean Campo. Um, but the effects of that boom were felt unevenly. So as Jessica Buds, uh, who will supply the map for the next slide, argues Chile's approach to water governance favored large economic interests, whereas the peasant sector is weak and poorly organized and receives little state assistance. And um, that kind of general pattern continues today. So Chile's mode of natural resource management has failed to contribute either to social equity or to good environmental management. Um, so macroeconomic growth, uh, which did indeed occur 
came with both environmental and social costs, um, overdrawing basins and exacerbating rural inequalities. And interestingly, the Chilean model, the kind of turn to markets as a, a mechanism for governing water, then became in the 80s and 90s and into the 2000s, a sort of global touchstone that was touted in bodies like the UN as a way to reform water systems. Um, and now, of course, that, that picture has become more complicated, particularly in an era of drought. So uh, in Chile, in response to privatization, as elsewhere in response to privatization, um, social movements have risen up sort of to, to challenge the effects of privatization. And where then did Modatima come from? Aha. Um, so this is Petorca. Uh, and my research is gonna focus on the Petorca and La Liwa valleys um, here in the Quinta Region. They're semi-arid and they run from the low Andes to the Pacific Ocean. And one thing that's kind of notable about them and sort of means that they've been cursed in this era of climate change is that you can see they start lower in the pre-cordillera instead of the cordillera itself. And so this is the Aconcagua Basin. It starts super high up, Choapa, same deal. And that means that there's much more um, snowpack year over year. Whereas in these lower mountains, climate change has really kind of devastated the yearly precipitation. Um, so uh, so that's, that's left this area kind of particularly vulnerable to drought. The residents of the province have traditionally relied on um, subsistence agriculture and on artisanal mining, small scale mining. Um, and uh, around 30% live in rural areas and around 30% work in ag. Um, from the late 70s to the late 2000s, amid Pinochet's reforms, or in the aftermath, I suppose, of Pinochet's reforms, the ratio of subsistence crops to export-oriented fruit cro crops flipped from six to one to one to nine, so there was kind of a major revamping of this system toward export. Um, and Chilean avocado production grew eightfold in the two decades after 1995. Chile became the world's third largest exporter. Uh, and Petorca's orchards peaked at 40% of the planted avocado area of Chile and now have dropped to 25%, so still um, a, a, a large proportion. And this area south actually has become the epicenter as Petorca and La Ligua have dwindled. So, Part of the story here is that advancements in water drilling technologies and the availability of land on the steeper hillsides were key drivers of this expansion of avocado. And you can see that um, in, in this picture. So, um, so, so that style of farming depends on deep wells being drilled um, and then groundwater being pumped onto uh, these hillsides. Larger farmers, could petition for new underground water rights with legal professionals. They, had, they were more well resourced um, and peasants were left uh, in this area increasingly water bereft. Um, so amid a rush then to secure water rights as avocado exports boomed, the prospects of shortages and indeed like actually existing shortages um, made people turn towards speculation as sort of a perverse solution to scarcity. Um, and now, uh, and very strikingly in this area, uh, as communities have lost their access to water, they now rely on water from truck beds being um, driven in. And so hanging out here means kind of seeing these water trucks always circulating through. Um, so Modatima kind of emerged in response to that matrix of changes in 2012, and they publicized the province's drought as an emblem of Chile's water wars more generally. Um, so when the huge protests produced the draft constitution, Modatima's uh, hoped for changes were incorporated into the draft. They included um, the state reasserting greater control over water. So right now water acts as de facto a permanent property right the state would have instead granted it on a um, medium term basis. Um, and that is a, that, that's a change that really rankled, I think, um, a lot of property holders in water. Um, human consumption would have been prioritized over economic production. 
uh, and the Constitution would have stipulated separate bodies overseeing water basin by basin, and that change will be adopted in limited form um, in La Ligua. It's also being adopted. There's a Consejo uh, de Cuenca that's happening, that's being instituted here on the Maipo, um, which is where Santiago gets its water. Um, other social movement demands may find regional life via the administration of Rodrigo Mundaca, who is now, who founded Modatima and is now the governor of Valparaiso's um, region. And an interesting note that I'd be happy to discuss more after if you want, is that um, despite all of this, Patorca as a whole itself voted against the constitution as well. So. My research questions that I'm here hoping to think about are um, first, how is drought uh, interpreted, mobilized, and managed by state authorities, by private industry and civil society, and by social movements? Um, and I put drought in quotation marks not to suggest that there is not drought, um, but just to suggest that the idea of drought itself is kind of contested by differently oriented social actors. Um, so for some people, drought is more of an artificial question of distribution of the water that exists. Um, and for other people, um, the, it, it's more of a question of, um, of there being an overall scarcity and just greatly diminished supplies of water. Uh, and my second question is, to what degree and how is this a moment of transition from the so-called neoliberal era of water governance in Chile? Um, and insofar as new, a new water system is emerging in Chile, uh, what social forces are determining the direction that it will take. And I do, so this is kind of what's animating, I guess, um, that my, my, my interest in Chile generally, which is um, that I have the sense that the way, uh, the, the way that water has heretofore been governed is falling apart to some degree. So, I mean, one clue is all the changes in the draft constitution in 2022, but also the federal government has announced a just hydrological transition. Um, okay, great. Um, and um, and there, there's, the, there's the Consejos de Cuenca, there's kind of, the, there, there's new institutions that are arising as, as presumably emergency measures to deal with drought, um, but together I think they speak to uh, a sort of fraying. And, and most to the point um, is that you know, as, as water rights exist right now, they're, they're permanent property rights, but there's not enough wet water to sort of fulfill all the paper water that people are entitled to. And so that fundamental disconnect means that, um, you know, it's something that has to be dealt with. So I'm running out of time. Um, maybe then uh, the last thing that I'll get into is I've been here for the last six weeks now. I've been up and hanging out in this area to, um, a bit. And so, you know, just a few interesting things have emerged um, already. You know, they're just inklings. It's not like I have findings yet or anything. Um, one uh, piece is that as social movement actors have gotten involved in government, they seem, uh, from what they've told me, they've lost their appetite to some degree for kind of politicized distributional questions. And they've gotten more interested in things like desal as a solution. Um, so I think, and, and I think the question of how sort of can social movements affect change via the mechanisms of the state is a generally interesting one. Um, and it's not always so simple. Um, the, another piece is that um, some, some people have been saying that the idea of climate change and drought induced by climate change means that um, that distributional questions can be then sort of attributed to sequia instead of saqueo or theft. Um, so like the existence of the, the fact that people can say, well, look, the climate is changing, there's less water, um, becomes kind of a convenient rhetorical umbrella for those who have um, sort of consolidated most water resources in this basin. Um, and this uh, is my man, Don Wheelie, um, who's a campesino organizer. He's 80 years old. I was extremely jazzed to talk to him, to him about like land reform and kind of counter reform. And he was actually not particularly interested to talk about that. Um, and which I think is like a helpful thing to encounter in field work, you know? Um, and when I asked him, you know, what do you want to see? He's been involved in all these different forms of, of campesino organizing. And, and then he went on this long tangent about nuts and about how to like 
turn nuts into profit better and different uh, different ideas for buen negocio and that's what that is what he's interested in not land reform or like relitigating land reform you know um, so thought that was interesting and that is maybe where I'll leave you because um, I'm running out of time right yeah okay great yeah. <laughs>